In this lecture, we will begin our discussion on acid-base chemistry. We will begin with fundamental definitions and concepts. There are certain physical properties of acids and bases that have been known by chemists for hundreds of years. For example, acids tend to have a sour taste. Think of vinegar or lemon juice, which are both acidic. They also tend to cause certain dyes to change color. Bases tend to have a bitter taste. For example, many green leafy vegetables like spinach and kale are basic, and they tend to feel slippery to the touch. But in order to be useful, chemists need a more precise and functional definition of acids and bases. It was the Swedish chemist Svante Arrhenius who gave the first modern definition of acids and bases. Under his definition, an Arrhenius acid is any species that, when dissolved in water, increases the concentration of H plus ions. H plus ions are also known as protons. This should make sense. The hydrogen atom consists of one proton and one electron. If we ionize it by removing the electron, all we're left with is a bare proton. An Arrhenius base is any species that, when dissolved in water, increases the concentration of hydroxide ions. Let's look at two examples. First, when hydrogen chloride gas is bubbled through water, it dissolves into the water. The reaction is HCl gas in the presence of water, forming H plus ions and chloride ions in solution. By dissolving the HCl, we are increasing the concentration of H plus in solution. Therefore, HCl behaves as an Arrhenius acid. Secondly, consider lithium hydroxide, which is a strong electrolyte that completely dissociates in water. The reaction is lithium hydroxide solid in the presence of water, forming lithium plus ions and hydroxide ions in solution. By dissolving the lithium hydroxide in water, we increase the concentration of hydroxide ion in solution. Therefore, lithium hydroxide is an Arrhenius base. The Arrhenius definition certainly gives a more systematic treatment of acids and bases, and we have a good start with it. But the definition is still very limited. Most notably, the Arrhenius definition requires the system to be aqueous. This can be a very limiting requirement, especially in organic chemistry where water is a very poor solvent. Clearly, a more general definition is required. Throughout the course of this chapter, we will discuss two. We will focus on the first one for the majority of the chapter and revisit the second one at the end. Danish chemist Johannes Bronsted and English chemist Thomas Lowry independently devised a more inclusive definition for acids and bases in the 1920s. A Bronsted-Lowry acid is defined to be any compound that can donate a proton to another compound. A Bronsted-Lowry base is any compound that can accept a proton from another compound. Bronsted-Lowry acids are often referred to as proton donors, and Bronsted-Lowry bases are often called proton acceptors. It is important to realize that all Arrhenius acids are Bronsted-Lowry acids, and all Arrhenius bases are Bronsted-Lowry bases. This is a broader definition that includes the more restricted definition. The Bronsted-Lowry definition alleviates several of the restrictions of the Arrhenius definition. Several of these are listed below. First, there is no requirement that the system be in water solution. In fact, there is no mention of the solvent at all. Secondly, it stresses the fact that any acid-base reaction will generally occur in pairs. We have to have an acid that donates a proton and a base that accepts the proton in the same reaction. Thirdly, it addresses a known fact about protons in water that is ignored by the Arrhenius definition. Bare protons are extremely reactive in water, and consequently they do not exist as H plus in water solutions. 
Now, there is still a great deal of debate, even to this day, about the real structure of protons and water. The proton tends to cause clustering of water molecules around it, but the exact number of these waters is not really known. It is accepted, however, that all of these clusters involve a basic component known as the hydronium or oxonium ion, H3O+. Thus, when we have H plus in aqueous solution, we have to include the association with water, H plus aqueous plus water forming hydronium ion. Anytime we have a reaction involving protons and water, it is generally more accurate to use H3O plus ion rather than H plus. However, we will treat them both as equivalent in these lectures. Let's return to our HCl example. We saw earlier that when HCl is bubbled through water, it acts as an Arrhenius acid, but is it also a Bronsted-Lowry acid? Recall in the previous example, we did not explicitly include the water in the reaction, and we had H plus as a product. But we now know that the proton will immediately react with a water molecule to form the hydronium ion. Therefore, the full reaction, including water, becomes HCl gas plus H2O liquid, forming hydronium ion and chloride ion in solution. We can now see that the HCl is donating a proton to the water and is therefore a Bronsted-Lowry acid. Also, we see that the water accepts the proton, making it a Bronsted-Lowry base. Further, we see that we have to have both an acid and a base reacting together in the Bronsted-Lowry definition. Now let's consider the example of bubbling ammonia gas through water. The associated reaction is NH3 aqueous plus water in equilibrium with the NH4 plus or ammonium ion plus the hydroxide ion in solution. Notice that adding NH3 to water results in an increase in the concentration of OH minus. Therefore, ammonia is an Arrhenius base. But is it also a Bronsted-Lowry base? Since the NH3 accepts a proton from water, it is also a Bronsted-Lowry base. We see something unusual here, however. Note that the water is now donating the proton, which makes it a Bronsted-Lowry acid. But in the previous example, water was a Bronsted-Lowry base. Water is a special type of molecule that we refer to as amphiprotic. This means that it can both accept and donate a proton. At this point, we have seen that we have to have both an acid and a base reacting together for any acid-base reaction to occur. But recall that at any time we have an acid-base equilibrium, such as our ammonia equilibrium, we can have a reaction in either the forward or the reverse direction. This means that we must have both an acid and a base on each side of the reaction. So let's return to the ammonia with water reaction. NH3 plus H2O in equilibrium with the ammonium ion plus the hydroxide ion in solution. In the forward direction, we saw that water donates a proton and acts as a Bronsted-Lowry acid and that the NH3 accepts the proton acting as a Bronsted-Lowry base. In the reverse direction, the ammonium ion donates the proton and acts as the Bronsted-Lowry acid, and the hydroxide ion accepts the proton acting as a Bronsted-Lowry base. So we now see that the acid in the forward direction generates the base for the reverse direction. Likewise, the base in the forward direction becomes the acid for the reverse reaction. These matched pairs are referred to as conjugate acid-base pairs. We always form a conjugate acid from a base by adding on one additional hydrogen to the structure and increasing the charge by one. We always form a conjugate base from an acid by removing one hydrogen from the structure and decreasing the charge by one. Let's look at two examples. 
First is the reaction of nitrous acid with the cyanide ion in equilibrium with the nitrite ion and hydrogen cyanide. It should be clear that the nitrous acid is the acid in this reaction, but even if we didn't know its name, we noticed that it is donating the proton to the cyanide. The conjugate base of the nitrous acid is the nitrite ion. Notice that we form the conjugate base by removing a proton and decreasing the charge by one from zero to negative one. The bronsted lowry base in this reaction is the cyanide ion. It accepts the proton from the nitrous acid and forms its conjugate acid, which is hydrogen cyanide. Again, notice that we add a hydrogen to the structure and increase the charge by one from negative one to zero. Now let's consider the reaction of the dihydrogen phosphate ion with a fluoride ion. In this case, there's no indication by the name that the dihydrogen phosphate ion is an acid, but we can clearly see that it is donating the proton to the fluoride ion. The conjugate base of H2PO4- minus is the monohydrogen phosphate ion HPO4-2-. minus. Once again, notice that we have removed a hydrogen from the structure and decreased the charge by one from negative one to negative two. The fluoride ion is acting as our bronsted lowry base and accepts the proton from the H2PO4 minus. Its conjugate acid is hydrofluoric acid. Once again, notice that we have added a hydrogen to the structure and increased the charge on the structure from negative one to zero. We will return to building conjugates in a few minutes. But right now, let's see if we can't learn to identify certain acids and bases from their structure. First, inorganic acids will typically have the ionizable proton listed first in the structure. The ionizable proton is the proton that is being donated. Examples of this include hydrochloric acid, HCl, nitric acid, HNO3, and sulfurous acid, H2SO3. Inorganic bases sometimes have a hydroxide group. Examples include sodium hydroxide or strontium hydroxide. Many bases are negatively charged, allowing them to accept the positively charged proton. This includes ions such as the cyanide ion, Cn-, and the hydrogen sulfide ion, Hs. Most organic acids will have what's referred to as a carboxyl group attached to it. The carboxyl group is a side chain that has a C double bond O bonded to an OH group. This is oftentimes indicated just as COOH. The hydrogen on the COOH group is the ionizable hydrogen, and so this deprotonates to the form COO minus. The most common type of organic base includes what's known as an amine group. This is a nitrogen bonded to three other groups, either a carbon group or a hydrogen. Three examples are shown here. In the first, we have a nitrogen bonded to a CH3 group and two hydrogens, giving a total of three groups. The second has a CH3 group, a CH2 CH3 group, and a hydrogen again giving three groups bonded to the nitrogen. Lastly, we have no hydrogens, but we have two CH3 groups and a CH2 CH3 group. This is also an amine. In all of these cases, the nitrogen accepts the proton and the charge increases by one. So now let's put this all together. We're going to identify several compounds as either being an acid, a base, or possibly amphiprotic. For each case, we're going to indicate the conjugate or conjugates for each species. To begin with, we have HNO2. As you recall, this is nitrous acid and is therefore an acid. We recognize this by the ionizable proton at the beginning of the compound formula. The conjugate base is formed by removing the hydrogen and decreasing the charge by one 
forming NO2 minus. Second is the cyanide ion. Again, because it's negatively charged and has no protons on it, we can assume it's going to be a base. To form the conjugate acid, we add a hydrogen ion to the structure and increase the charge by one from negative one to zero. This gives HCN as the conjugate acid. This next compound is called ethylamine. Notice that it has a carbon group and two hydrogens bonded to a nitrogen. This makes it an organic base. As before, we form the conjugate acid by adding a hydrogen to the nitrogen in this case and increasing the charge by plus one. This gives us the form of the conjugate acid as CH3, CH2, NH3+. Next, we see that this compound has the COOH group, making it an organic acid. Its name is benzoic acid. To form the conjugate base, we remove the hydrogen from the COOH group and decrease the charge by one. This gives us C6H5COO- or the benzoate ion. This compound really doesn't match any of our patterns we've seen so far. But notice that since it already has four hydrogens and a plus charge on it, the likelihood of being able to add an H plus to it is very small. In fact, it should be much easier to pull an H plus off of it. So this compound is an acid. We form the conjugate base, again, by removing a hydrogen and decreasing the charge by one. This gives us the form pH3 as the conjugate base. This next compound is the acetate ion. Notice that it looks almost like an organic acid, except that it's missing its hydrogen on the COO group. This means it is an organic base. We want to add the hydrogen to the COO minus group and increase the charge to form CH3COOH as the conjugate acid. This is acetic acid. This next compound looks sort of like an amine, but notice that it has four groups attached to the nitrogen, two CH3 groups, and two hydrogens, and it has an overall charge of plus one. This indicates that it is an amine that has been protonated and therefore behaves as an acid. To form the conjugate base, we remove a hydrogen from the nitrogen and decrease the charge by one. This gives us the structure CH3 taken twice, NH, as our conjugate base. Lastly, we have the monohydrogen phosphate ion. Notice that there is an ionizable proton at the front of this structure, and therefore it's going to behave as an acid. But because it also has a negative two charge, it is able to accept a proton as well. This means that we have an amphiprotic structure. To form the conjugate acid of the monohydrogen phosphate ion, we add a hydrogen to the front and increase the charge by one, forming H2PO4 minus, or the dihydrogen phosphate ion. To form the conjugate base, we remove the hydrogen from the front of the structure and decrease the charge by one, forming the phosphate ion as the conjugate base. This concludes the first lecture on acid-base chemistry. In this introductory lecture, we have learned several important ideas. First, we have seen two different definitions of acids and bases, the Arrhenius definition and the Bronsted-Lowry definition. The Bronsted-Lowry definition introduced the concept of conjugate acid-base pairs. Further, we have learned to identify different types of acids and bases based on their chemical structure. And lastly, we learned to write the conjugate form of an acid or a base.